In Trams and Tram Enthusiasts, Martin Jenkins talks to fellow enthusiasts about their lifelong passion for the tram car. His journey begins on one of the world's oldest trams in regular service, the open-fronted, single-decker car number one of the Manx Electric Railway. This is a good moment if you want to try your hand at a controller. Oh, I'd love to, yes, I really would. Just be patient with it, don't be too rapid and feeling up. I won't indeed. Otherwise it will bite back. <laughs> Put a second one on. That's it, just do it gently. Try a third one. That's it. Hold. 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 When you're in these points, these major points, you're on the resistance. Right. When it gets overheated. So I'll bring it up again. One, two, three. Hold it there a moment. Let go. Back to half again. Feel the response oh, with every point. It's a wonderful sensation, I mean, the most exciting experience. Absolutely exhilarating to be driving a car built in 1893. You can feel the car just responding to you. And it is, oh, well, it's beyond words for me. It's something I've always dreamed about. And to actually be able to do it and to feel the car respond, you can actually hear the surge of the motors and obviously you have to be careful coming towards curves so that you don't go too fast and the wheels bite into the curve and cause problems and we're now in full parallels that's the car going at the fastest speed and she's really bucking and swaying on the track but responding marvelously and we're coming towards a curve and we throw off now to full series as we come towards the curve i can't tell you how exciting this is and one can't really believe that she's built in 1893. I think tramway and public transport enthusiasm generally has grown up over the last 20 years in, in a remarkable way. There were 20 years ago professional, you might call them, enthusiasts who actually went out of their way to preserve these vehicles and to keep them from being consigned to breakers yard. Um, but at that time, there wasn't the same sort of general strong link between transport management and enthusiasts there is now and there probably wasn't the same sort of trust and we have to remember that enthusiasts were looking at the management who were busy wrecking and tearing to pieces their their pride and joy the one tram that always wanted to keep was now going to be destroyed managements in the past were very suspicious of enthusiasts at times of tramway and trolleybus abandonment they got themselves a bad name basically for two reasons the first was because of their firm belief in and passion for electric traction, they sometimes uh, lobbied uh, the local media, uh, the local councillors, uh, with information and suggestions as to why these vehicles should be retained, perhaps after there'd been a long and even acrimonious debate locally. And this caused a great deal of embarrassment with the transport undertakings, and usually, because of that, a great deal of extra work, which certainly wasn't wanted. Unfortunately, there was another group who used to go round depots by night removing pieces of equipment and items from tram cars uh, to, to save as souvenirs and memorabilia. And uh, they got a particularly bad name with transport undertakings, but it is one of the superb ironies that 30 or 40 years on, we're in a situation where many transport undertakings who themselves didn't have an eye to the future or uh, realise the value of the equipment they were disposing of, uh, save nothing at all of their tram cars and trolley buses and now um, seeking out these items that were um, uh, removed without authority by enthusiasts, perhaps for loan or display in connection with centenary exhibitions and so forth. So uh, I suppose one could argue that the enthusiasts did have a certain eye for the future, uh, which the undertakings themselves did not. I thought that the only thing that we'd remember the trams by was photographs and I used to collect bits of the cars, I used to visit the scrapyard. In fact, um, when I started work, I used to take about an hour and ten minutes for lunch because I could just get down to the scrapyard and back and take a few photographs and also um, take a few bits. And I felt that these bits were probably going to be the only tangible souvenirs. And of course, I wasn't the only person collecting them. There was quite, quite a lot of competition for the more desirable 
pieces. I don't think I've ever been rapacious in my collecting. I, I don't think I've ever done anybody a dirty turn or um, stolen anything. I was three and a half. We were evacuated at the time to North Wales and we'd gone shopping one day in Landidno and at that time there was a tramway system which operated between Landidno and Colwyn Bay. And when it came time to go home, I said to my mother, I'm going back on the tram. And I remember that journey vividly. It was a dark, wet, drizzling day. I went upstairs on my own. My mother went downstairs. And I can remember sitting there in the pitch black, listening to the swish of the trolley on the overhead wire and the whine of the motors, and feeling a, an enormous sense of adventure. And from that moment, I think I developed this kind of infatuation with the tram car, but it was a very personal thing. It was not until I was 11 or 12 that I read in the local newspaper in Liverpool at the time of tramway abandonment of an organisation called the Light Railway Transport League, which was a body of enthusiasts devoted not only to the retention of tram cars, but also to the idea of modern trams. And from then on, I formed a, a, a wide body of friends, all interested in tram cars, and we've remained friends ever since. And funnily enough, of course, now, instead of going to tramway abandonments, we spend quite a bit of time going to the reopening of tramway systems. Today, probably, th there is this um, problem of the kids are bored and they're too much into pop music. And I often heard my father say that they made their entertainment. Well, I think we made ours. We, we had a ready-made entertainment in the tramway system. It was full of interest for us, um, the routes, the overhead wires, the tracks, and so on. So, but the parents were quite happy that we were interested in something. My interest in trams is very wide-ranging from an aesthetic point of view because I'm a highway engineer. I have an interest in the engineering, the track work, the overhead wiring, the construction of the cars and their maintenance. I also have a feeling for the character, the construction, the sort of personality of the tram, particularly as many of the older ones were hand-built and had their own individual characteristics, unlike the mass production of so many other things today. So I'm aware of that feeling, particularly when I'm traveling in one, its own peculiar motion, its own design and construction and mode of operation, which differs from so many other vehicles. I decided to follow the, the last tram procession on my bike so I could get pictures on the various sections of the route. And following down the last tram as it went into the, the works for the last time, the crowds around, the corporation transport band playing their sad songs of farewell. And I stood there and watched as each of the 13 last trams went into the depot. I thought, this, this is the end. Tomorrow will be completely empty. And the last day itself, the 14th of September 1957, was a sort of cloudy, bright day, spots of sunshine and so on. It turned out rather, rather dry. But the next morning, the Sunday, was the worst time of all. There was the, the tracks with a thin film of yellow rust. The wires were hanging forlornly, and the whole place looked empty. There was something that had been taken away that would never be replaced. And now back at New Cross, we've just seen the most fantastic sight. People leaping on top of the last tram, the last special car, standing on the roof, pulling the seatings and the linings to pieces. And now the car is just about to enter New Cross Depot to reverse and to come out for Penhall Road. My own emotions on these closures were rather mixed. Um, a great sadness, of course. I used to feel very often on the point of tears when the last tram on a system rolled into the shed for the last time and everything was finished. It was like losing, you know, some friends or very dear relatives or something. It's like as though something had been taken out of your life, a hole cut in your soul almost. <laughs> you know, it might sound rather silly talking like this, but... Uh, it is a fact you do find enormous um, sadness. I think that's the best way of putting it. 
and to a certain extent anger because it was all so unnecessary. I just feel that here is something I can completely trust. I never hurry. I know the tram's going to come. It gets me to where I want at the time I expect. I do everything completely relaxed. I don't go to the bus stop, as I do here, for example, and curse and fume, wondering if the bus is going to get me to the destination in time. There I know the tram will. So London said farewell to its tramways. Electric vehicles running on rails laid in the roads a method of transport which may now seem strange to those too young to remember the events of July 5th, 1952. The main worry is the lack of young recruits to the hobby because there aren't very many tramways now, not in Britain anyway, and apart from the modellers this does mean that the um, uh, the average age of those interested tends to rise and those who drop off at one end of the scale are not being replaced by others at the bottom end of the scale. Switch it on and then like the real thing. Landidno number two, that's one of the old Accrington cars. That's right, the old Accrington car. What gauge is it? This is three and a half inches, and it's built to a scale of three quarters to the foot. Isn't that superb? Look at her coming in now. Liverpool's only single decker, really, in the, the years after the first German cars, isn't it? 757. That's right. How beautiful. 757. Ah, oh, isn't that marvellous? To come out here and play quite often. I made it my business to perhaps mention in passing that if people had some photographs that they they weren't bothered to keep or would let me copy or let me have the negatives then i'd be glad to acquire them buy them if necessary how large is the collection now well i would think 60 to 100 thousand 60 to 100 thousand mm. negatives yes well i do work quite hard in the dark room if people want photographs from me i usually try and accede to their requests. I'm, I'm, I'm not a particularly fast producer. In fact, um, I regret to say that there's one enthusiast who wanted a photograph of a Myringdon tram who died before he got it. What are your oldest negatives? Some taken in Liverpool in 1899 with one of the original roll film codecs. They're square negatives on very heavy celluloid. And also I've got some glass plate negatives. Some of those go back beyond the turn of the century. But most of the negatives I've got are probably taken in the 20s, 30s. They are willed to the Tramway Museum. All over the house we've got evidence that my husband is a tram enthusiast. In the kitchen here, you see on the wall over the table, uh, frames of tram tickets. We have um, a poster saying tram conversion to buses. We have another one saying to and from Portobello Beach and Pool. We have no smoking signs. Uh, and you can imagine what it's like. I mean, we have friends sitting here for dinner and they're gazing enraptured at these numbers, trying to make polite conversation about them. And then all of a sudden, about halfway through the evening, somebody will say, uh, uh, what's the relevance of 261? And of course then my husband starts. We have all the history of Tram 261 and that takes up the rest of the evening. I mean, once you get him on to his pet subject, that's it. Um, yes, in the bathroom we have a cupboard which is um, absolutely full of tram slides. Everywhere you can go, I can guarantee you open a cupboard and there is tram stuff there. It's just everywhere. Thank goodness he didn't try and collect tram track because we just wouldn't be able to live in the house then. Which is this one, Miguel? That one is from Edinburgh. 
50 pound to the yard it weighed. Now this one here, oop, uh, this is from Glasgow. That's right, it is 18, 1879. This is the first girder rail section that was used in Glasgow. So that's horse track? A horse car track, horse yes. Car track. How do you get these small slivers of track? By sawing them. Just a large hacksaw. That must have taken a lot of time. About uh, an hour or so. It all depends on the hardness of the steel sometimes. You live, in fact, in one of the Salvation Army hostels in, in Manchester. Yes, this one. Where did you used to keep the track? A, a shed at the back. Everything is all been cleared out now. There's only the rice and the grinder. Well, and were, were the people in the Salvation Army helpful? Yes, they, they were all right. They, they helped me. They did? They did, yes. They encouraged me. And they, they noticed it, it, this was a rather rare hobby. I think I told you about the coffin. Oh, do tell us. Oh, yes. That's the biggest thing I've got. It's at Cranks Museum. Double track over double track. The last tramway coffin ever on any British system. Where was that? Argyle Street over Jamaica Street, Glasgow. Now, there's another great big junction, isn't there, at Crouch as well? From, from Salford. That's right, the Grand Salford, Salford's Grand Union. Can you describe that? Yes. Double track over double track, and double track curves on all four corners, on both sides. What were the noises like on that, when the trams ran on it? This particular one, dead silence, and crack, 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 crack. Well, Mmm, silence. It's the new work. But I remember the old one. What was that Ooh, like? the cars went crash, 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 crash over it. <laughs> yes, the four wheelers, bang, bang, well, that's it, they crashed over it. And the bogey cars went crash, 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 crash. It made a terrible racket, you had because we heard far and wide. <laughs> At the time of tramway abandonment, most enthusiasts, of course, were collecting bits and pieces from the cars, but there were others that had the vision to realise that the only way you could preserve the tram for posterity was to create a living, active museum in which the tram cars could be seen to be operating. And this is what they achieved here at the National Tramway Museum at Crouch in Derbyshire. In recent years, it's become more, though, than just an operating museum. It's become an archival repository. There are now huge collections of tickets, of photographs, of plate glass negatives, of records from transport authorities, so that in years to come, people will be able to come and look at these archives and trace the history of all the various undertakings that used to be, of course, tramway operators in Great Britain. Now, on top of that, there's the trams, and there's the trams not only from Britain, but from all over the world. There are trams from, from Porto in Portugal, from Johannesburg, from Vienna, from the United States. Um, I'm actually sitting at the moment in the front seat of one of my own very personal favourite trams, a Green Goddess from Liverpool, built in 1936. Uh, it was sold to Glasgow in 1954, and then when that system was threatened with closure, a group of enthusiasts from Merseyside decided to rescue the tram and hopefully preserve it for posterity, and this is exactly what they did. And 25 years later, here it is at Crouch, fully restored. It's a magnificent achievement. And interestingly, next to it, I can just see it through the glass, is a car that came from... Czechoslovakia. It's Prague number 180 and this car has a very interesting history because it was donated to the museum by some officials who came over from Czechoslovakia and it managed to get out of the country literally hours before the Russians invaded in 1968. So that car really is something quite special. It's an absolutely ideal location for school children and students to visit and to be able to see at first hand exactly what transport was like in years gone by. Everything is here. It's available to them. 
they're able to talk to people here who have the knowledge to explain to them there are excellent displays in the museum and because it's a working museum they can see exactly how things work and how they developed. This is an American streetcar we're on at the moment. From the outside it looks a little bit like a railway car but from inside it behaves exactly like a tram car. They've definitely got a mind of their own of tram cars, I'm sure of it. One pair will often leak its air off for no reason at all. It can be out all day and work normally, then on the last trip it'll suddenly lose all its air. You've done nothing wrong, it's just a car that's cantankerous. I think it's just that the, the vehicles themselves are just so different to anything else which is on the road, as it were. The way a tram car works, the sort of terminal arrangements on a tram car, eh, it doesn't physically turn round. It's just the seats that turn. The museum's run by the Tramway Museum Society. It's a voluntary body. Most of us are volunteers working on our holidays and so on, although we have one or two full-time staff, mainly on the workshop side. We rely on public donations and entrance fees for, to provide funds for tramcar restoration. In the furthest two depots, we have an exhibition of Victorian tramcars. There are two horse trams there. There is also a very important tram, Blackpool No. 1 of 1885, and that was Britain's first electric street tramway car. 1985, of course, will be the centenary of tramway operation in Blackpool. And so we are anticipating that some of our Blackpool Museum trams we have here will be returning to the promenade line for a grand parade. We're restoring a Blackpool double-deck tram at the moment, if you look inside the workshop entrance. That'll probably cost us 40, 50,000 pounds to complete. The celebrations in Blackpool this year are going to be the most exciting event that's happened to the tramway enthusiasts for many years. And, and it, nothing like this will happen again for many more years. We're all tremendously looking forward to it. Not only the enthusiasts, but I think the management have got the bug as well. They suddenly realise that um, it's going to be fun. We're going to have trams ranging from 1885 to 1985. And perhaps we should mention this aspect that we're not all um, nostalgia and old hat. We have some very technically advanced vehicles. Uh, we're rather proud of these. These have been designed by the department and manufactured by English manufacturers and this is a, I think it's a new era because we've used modern technology and modern techniques to build these cars. This is your new generation of tram cars. The new generation of tram cars. So it isn't just a hundred years of trams, it's the first hundred years of trams. Yes. We're now into the second. And I think that this is one of the, the really magic parts about this year, that you've got these trams that have come back from the dead and they're back in normal service, carrying the holiday makers, ordinary people, while they're on holiday. And I think you have a sense of pride and achievement. That you've managed to resurrect this um, dead piece of wood. And that you'll get a lot of people, say, from Manchester and Glasgow and Leeds and Sheffield, and they'll see these trams. Hey, I used to ride on them when I was a kid. And people say this to me time and time again. It brings back their childhood memories of when they used to go to school on the trams, when they used to go to work on the trams. Absolute joy of seeing this car again running in the street. The other thing which is very difficult to describe, of course, is the glorious smells which come out of the motors. It's a combination of hot oil, of grease, of burning electricity, but it all combines to make a very unique smell and uh, one can sit and absorb that smell and that combined with the roar of the motors when the tram is working flat out is part of the magic of the old style tram car. Uh, we're approaching now the junction with the Stockel route which is one of the lines which could be threatened in Brussels by an extension of the metro system. In recent years there's been a tremendous resurgence of interest and in fact the introduction of completely new tramway and light railway systems both in Europe and in America, in places such as San Diego, which has a completely new streetcar light railway system, places such as Edmonton and Calgary in Canada, Manila, Buenos Aires, they're busy, particularly in the ve developing countries, which is interesting, opening up new tramway and light railway systems. 
In this country, there are plans at present in Greater Manchester for bringing back light railways, which in fact, in certain cases, would run actually through the streets in the centre of Manchester. And of course, we've already got the excellent system which has been open for several years now in newcastle on tyne the Newcastle Metro. And interest in this sort of development, which is seen as very suitable and efficient and economical, particularly with regard to future oil shortages, uh, this is being pressed for by MPs. We, in, in, on Tyne's side, of course, have had uh, a very considerable success with the metro system. It runs right through my constituency, past my home, past my office, and to the central station. If we can get it running right to the airport, it will serve all the destinations I want. And other cities, I hope, are going to follow our example. Modern Tramways, a monthly magazine. There's a total circulation of Modern Tramway of about 6,500. It certainly is worldwide. Its aim is to give all kinds of information about tramways and light rapid transit, a whole spectrum of topics to a whole spectrum of readers, ranging from amateurs to professionals, and trying hard not to antagonize one side in catering for the other. We get information about what is going on in an undertaking, sometimes before the manager is aware of it, and in walking our tightrope, we're aware of the fact that in Britain particularly, people's interests tend to be very narrow, and even in the tramway field, there are people who are only interested in what went on in Britain, other people who are only interested in what goes on overseas, and some people are only interested in what happens, say, in the United States, for example. And I, I have to steer this rather difficult course, which generally means I annoy most people part of the time. And I think in that case, I'm doing a fairly good job. We're really probably the only frequently appearing specialist magazine. We get our news information by a kind of gigantic industrial worldwide espionage network. There's no other word for it. Because there, were, uh, there was no mass tourism into Russia, there was no incentive to publish guidebooks. And the only one I had was 1926. Now, I knew that the tramway systems of Moscow and Leningrad, or certainly Moscow, had changed mightily since 1926, because basically where the underground has been built in Moscow, the famous metro, the tramways have been taken off. And instead, new routes have been extended out into the new suburbs. So it took me about three and a half days to cover all the routes of Moscow, or nearly all the routes. I didn't quite have time to do the lot, and uh, I plotted them on this 1926 guide, and uh, of course in the new areas, uh, just did it from scratch. And uh, if one started drawing maps while travelling, it would really excite a bit of attention. So I used to go every half hour or so, every hour, break off, sit in the park and do my sketching there. We're going into another treasure trove now and uh Thank you, i know that lurking inside this depot are some venerable old trams which augsburg have hung on to even though they're not now in passenger service thank you oh this is a much uh, smaller area indeed and uh, there seem to be a number of uh, different looking vehicles in here the lights are being put on. Oh, I say. Just look at these. <sighs> right at the front, we've got a, a very venerable... Oh, and behind... Got a very venerable snow broom at the front, number 14, and behind it is a remarkable-looking vehicle. Oh, and this, this, is, this is the 1898 car. There are four trams in here. And uh, they're all absolutely beautifully restored. In fact, the one I'm looking at now, number 14, really um, superb looking car with a very old truck. It looks like all the photographs you see of Germany at the turn of the century when you see films on television trying to recapture the days of the Kaiser or whatever. It's almost entirely made of wood. There's wood, glass, uh, and a little bit of metal inside but very little and for me this is like finding um, a particularly rare stamp or a rare 
animal or looking at a painting or a work of art, I would come a long way to see something like this, and probably even further if I knew that it was going to run in service. I enjoyed going to the Isle of Man, to the horse-drawn trams, because horses are my interest. But I'm afraid that living here in the Blackpool area, as we do, I consider them to be rather ghastly bone shakers. They're still the same rickety old things that they've always been. Let's face it, the advantage with the tram enthusiast is that even when he's using his walking stick, he can still fumble onto his tram and rumble around to his heart's content. Uh, this enthusiasm, yes, it does cause friction. I mean, I can guarantee that about practically every holiday we've had, um, there's been some excuse for going 20 miles or sometimes even 100 miles to photograph some old tram. And uh, many a time on a holiday, I've just walked off and said, right, that's it. I don't, it's not a holiday for me. I just want to go away. You carry on with your trams and I will go elsewhere. I think if you, uh, if you don't have your own life and you live with somebody who has got such um, a passion for any activity, really, which is almost bordering on the sense of fanaticism, I think you do feel excluded to a certain extent. If you haven't got your own life and uh, perhaps haven't got a family, I should think it would drive you mad. Michael, most people go to China probably adventure of a lifetime, to look at the Great Wall, to see if they can find a panda, or to go and look at the remnants of the great Ming Dynasty. You went, of course, to look for the remnants of the tramway systems in China. Were there any surprises? Was there anything radically different from, say, systems in the rest of the world? Yes. Uh, the, the most noticeable feature, of course, is the very high frequency of service. And because there are no private cars, it's a totally uncluttered operation. Even when you're running a scheduled one-minute service, the service is perfectly spaced. It really is a sight for sore eyes. And I think the thing that struck us most was how sympathetic towards enthusiasts most people were. They were not only kind and helpful, but they really seemed uh, to understand what tram enthusiasm was all about. They really seemed uh, to think it was n nothing at all odd that people should be actually walking around their streets on their own or in twos and threes, uh, walking along the tram routes, photographing the cars, riding on them, taking tape recordings, actually crouching down in the streets to examine the trucks. This seemed to be something that they accepted as part of their daily routine. Uh, there was one marvellous instance in Dalian. You know, now, Dalian's a city that's only recently been reopened to Western tourists. And at one particular point on the tramway, uh, there is a junction where the cars come up from the depot to take up service. And at this particular junction, uh, there was a whole line of cars coming out of the depot, so I put the tripod up in order to film them going round the curve. And within a, a matter of half a minute, I must have had a crowd of 100 or 150 Chinese all around me, beautifully formed out in a long line. They were very orderly and very disciplined, and I could look through the viewfinder and get these cars coming into view. But the only problem was that as the cars came up to the junction and actually took the junction on the curve, of course, I could see through my viewfinder that all the Chinese were going to get in the way. So I sort of waved to them, and do you know the whole long line right wheeled out of the way? It was the most marvellous sight. Now, you went all the way to China to see the four remaining tram systems there. Where do you go now? Hanoi. Hanoi, of course, has a lot of second-hand trams from France. That's one that's eluded me up till now. I'm still trying. Sometimes when we go into Daddy's room, he's pretending to be a tram driver, and he's, he's going like this and pulling all the handles and things, pretending to be one. And he lets us be the passengers, and we sit on the back. And we tend to be the passengers. <laughs> it's really good.
If you would like, I'll try and attempt to um, make my own noises as to what I thought a tram would do. Now you can imagine this is a particular stretch of route in Wallasey, a stretch of track from what used to be Egremont Ferry, which has long since gone. There were several junctions in various directions. Cars from Seacombe would roll up and then proceed through the two spring points and up a long length of single track and the cars used to clang over another junction at the top into double track once more. The joy of the downward trip towards Seacombe was always that they actually crossed over the whole crossing at the bottom with a glorious racket. In it. And those are the parts that I can remember so vividly. Now it's stopped at the official stop, halfway over the crossover. And then starting off, it would be, the bell would ring, sort of ting ting, and then off we'd go. Coming the other way, it was slightly more exciting because it was downhill. And you get the bell go again, ting ting. <laughs> That's bad as way, is the noise of the truck going into action. All the loose parts used to tighten up, you see. So it was. <laughs> of music to you? Do, you? do you do you hear it the same as music? Well, tram noises to me are a cinematical sound. I get all emotional when I think of them. But it, all the lovely things. When I look back into the past, I can see how beautiful things were and I can compare it with the inadequacies of, of today when everything seems to be becoming tawdry and trivial, whereas in the past everything was very purposeful and beautiful, where everyone aimed for the maximum beauty and efficiency, and whereas nowadays it was a couldn't care less attitude, and, and of course vandalism and all the rest of it that was unheard of when I was a child. I don't think it's true to say that we're children that have never grown up. I think we've all grown up, but we've retained an interest in those things which were of interest to us at a very tender age. This sort of hobby does tend to attract the, the lonely, um, the slightly unsociable types. Quite a number of um, tram enthusiasts are unmarried. Um, some of them are obsessively, um, compulsively acquisitive, and I, I find it a bit distasteful sometimes if they perhaps know that I've got some rare photographs, 
um, their trembling hands like drug addicts reaching for a fix grab the box and go through with almost indecent haste. I feel that tram enthusiasts are very nice people until they start talking about trams. The poor enthusiast, once he gets married, feels that he has to drag along the spouse. And I have been to a number of places with my husband, some very interesting because of the beautiful countryside, but to be honest, at other times, I was bored to death. My wife and children, I think, they, they put up with my, uh, my interests. Uh, they do pay a certain amount of lip service because they know it's what interests me. And I think when you live with people, you've got to sort of uh, be interested in, in what interests them to a point. Um, but I was so wrapped up in the trams that... Um, I jokingly say to the wife that if the trams didn't finish, I might never have married her, you see. Um, well, it can be quite interesting at times, but sometimes it can be a bit boring. Because I'm not really, that my interest isn't really trams. So I've got other interests. And um, quite a lot of my dad's stuff takes up some of my room space, which I would like to give to my hobbies. Going abroad is obviously fraught with difficulties. Have you run into any problems? There was a classic example when we spent seven hours in a police station on a beautiful hot sunny July day in Osijek in Yugoslavia because we inadvertently got the People's Shampoo Factory in a photograph first thing in the morning. But, uh, uh, but other things can be not so funny. Um, I've had a couple of uh, quite unpleasant incidents. One in Cleveland, Ohio, where uh, my colleague and I were set upon by uh, a group of youths and um, we were uh, held up, you might say, at, at knife point. I lost a cine camera and a tripod. He lost quite a lot of money and uh, we managed to escape, uh, fortunately, and I'm here to tell the tale. Do you think in any way you get a thrill from the danger involved? I mean, does it give an added excitement to the hobby? Oh yes, there's no doubt at all about that. I went to Hungary last autumn and it gave me the greatest of pleasure to come back and tell my colleagues that I've managed to walk and photograph without the slightest problem all uh, the uh, really industrial uh, sections of the Budapest tramway, which I haven't seen any views of before. Yes, there was a sense of achievement in that. My husband is the enthusiast and he drives me mad. <laughs> Well, he's he just trams. He has a one-track mind, a tram track. <laughs> I think she probably understands it. I think uh, sometimes she, she, she's even called it an, an, an addiction and um, regards it as something that I couldn't possibly give up. I don't think I could give it up, to be quite honest. And I, I don't think it'd be fair to ask me to do so because I wouldn't be the same person. <sighs> It's almost a kind of religion. As long as there are trams to discuss and all the paraphernalia of trams to worry about, life will go on. There's some meaning to life. I mean, you do get this feeling that they're all lads together and they will kind of help each other out in time of difficulties. But they are a breed on their own. We're coming towards another curve we've just thrown off and another gentle bit of power to get us round this curve now. Then I made a slight mistake and I threw off the power too much there. And, and we're now back on uh, full parallels again. Then you can hear the wind blowing in your face because we're actually exposed to the elements here. It's a beautiful sunny afternoon and I couldn't want to be doing anything else in the world. Not at the moment.
trams and tram enthusiasts, Martin Jenkins was talking to fellow enthusiasts.